Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Quite often, the small details in Christ's parables are very important. And that is certainly the case in our gospel text for today, this section of Luke chapter 10 that gives us what is perhaps the most famous of all of Christ's parables, the one known as the Good Samaritan. So in this parable, Jesus tells us that the man who ended up beaten and left for dead on the side of the road was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, if you know your geography of the area, this might sound a bit odd because Jericho is actually 14 miles northeast of Jerusalem. But when Jesus says down, he means down the mountain. He's talking about elevation rather than direction. But nonetheless, and regardless of how Jesus phrases it, the point is clear. This man is walking away from Jerusalem. So why is this important? Why exactly does it matter what this guy's destination is? What does that have to do with anything? Well, it's important because it helps us answer the question that the lawyer asks Jesus in earlier on in this text when he asks, who is my neighbor? The question that causes Christ to tell this parable. So Jerusalem was, for the Jews, the very center of their existence because it's where the temple was. The temple is where God promised to be with them and rule them and love them and protect them. So in the parable, Jerusalem represents the Jerusalem above. It represents heaven, holiness, and perfection. It represents the church the house of God, the place where the Lord is dwelling with us in all of his glory. And Jericho, on the other hand, was the former stronghold of the Canaanite people. It's the city that had to be, it was overrun with idolatry and wickedness when the Israelites conquered it. So here in the parable, Jericho represents the world, this world of sin and sorrow. And because this man is going towards Jericho, he's going the wrong way down this road. Instead of being like the Levite and the priest who are on their way into Jerusalem to perform their duties in the temple, this man is walking away from the temple. Instead of walking towards God, he's walking away from him. That's when the devil grabs a hold of this man, strips him and beats him and leaves him for dead in the midst of his sin. And so, when the priest and the Levites see this man, they don't feel a strong obligation to help him because he's going the wrong way down that road. And they imagine that this poor soul just probably got what it is that he deserved. Because they think that they are walking towards holiness, they don't think that they owe anything to this man who's walking away from it. If he'd been beaten and left for dead on their side of the road, if he'd been standing outside the gate of Jerusalem trying to get in to pay his, uh, get to give his obedience to God, and that's when the devil seized him, well then fine, perhaps they could lend him a helping hand and bring him in with them. But that's not what he was doing. He was walking down the wrong side of the road. And because of that, in their minds, he just really wasn't their neighbor. This is a mindset that we oftentimes find ourselves sharing. So are we kind to people who are in need? Yes. Are we generous? Of course, Americans are the most generous people on the face of the planet, American Christians in particular. Are we quick to come to the aid of those who are sick and struggling absolutely do we gladly give our money to people who have been do we gladly gladly give our money uh, to charities and GoFundMe pages in order to support people who are having a hard time and who've been victimized by this world of sin most definitely as long however as long as they are on the right side of the road as long as they are walking with us towards Jerusalem and not away from it But if we are convinced that those in need are walking on the wrong side of the road, and that's where they were when they were beaten and left for dead, very often our compassion dries up. 
We may feel sorry for them, and we may pity them. But like the priest and the Levite, we won't sacrifice of ourselves to help them. We won't give up doing the things that we think are more important. We won't make them more important than the things we think we have going on in Jerusalem. So we'll help our friends find a new job if they get fired. When the people that we love, when we know that these are God-fearing, loving, kind people, we'll call up other folks we know who might be hiring. We'll write letters of recommendation for them, even if we're not entirely convinced that our praise of them is 100% accurate. But if people have been hateful or cruel to us, and then they also lose their income, we just don't feel the same obligation to help. We don't come to their aid. We don't make those same phone calls. We just sort of look at them and think, well, knowing you, you probably brought this on yourself. So, you know, good luck. We'll give our money to help cure innocent children who have been diagnosed with cancer. But we're not as eager to give our money to help drug addicts get clean. When we see that our veterans are struggling to acclimate to life back home, we rush to their aid and we scream for the government to come help us and come stand beside us in this ditch and bind up the wounds of these faithful men and women who were torn apart as they led the march towards the city of God. But when we see that convicts are struggling to acclimate to life outside of prison, we don't really have any interest, in helping, any interest in helping them build a new life, and we scream at the government to stop wasting our tax dollars trying to patch up those sinners who were slithering towards Jericho and got what they deserved. And all of this, we look at the people who seem to be walking the wrong way down that road, people who are now lying half dead on the side of it, and we just sort of think to ourselves, you made your bed, now lie in it. And we walk on by. But, of course, when you looked with disdain on those that you didn't think you needed to help, you weren't walking away from those sinners towards Jerusalem. You were walking with those sinners towards Jericho. And when you despised and hated your neighbor by insisting that he wasn't your neighbor, there the devil overwhelmed you and beat you and stripped you and left you for dead on the wrong side of the road. So when you refused to show mercy to those who didn't deserve it, you found yourself equally in need of a mercy that you didn't deserve. But out of love for you, the Good Samaritan has come to give it. And Jesus is that Good Samaritan. This much is obvious from the fact that he is the one who comes to the aid of the half-dead sinner on the side of the road. But why is it that the hero, the savior of this story, is a Samaritan? Why is that detail important? Well, once again, the answer is in the geography. Like Jericho, Samaria is a sin-filled place north of Jerusalem. If you want to get there, you have to walk down the wrong side of the road. And so, even though Jesus isn't actually a Samaritan, he's presented as one because he's doing exactly that. He's walking down the wrong side of the road. He is eating with tax collectors and sinners. He is aligning himself with those whom the priests and the Levites and the chief priests and the scribes despise and don't consider their neighbors. And Jesus walks down the wrong side of this road not because he's pursuing sin, but because he is pursuing the sinners who were torn to pieces on that path. So when you were beaten and lying dead on the side of the road, Christ found you. 
When you cursed God with every step down that path of sin, God took on human flesh and walked that same path to come to your aid and to give you his love. When you gave Jesus no reason to call you his neighbor, he called you his neighbor. And he called you his own brother, and he came to you to make you exactly that, by binding up your wounds with his own. At the cross, Christ's hands and feet were pierced. At the cross, his flesh was torn apart with a crown of thorns. And after he breathed his last, his side was pierced in his death. Jesus Christ gave you wound after wound after wound. In his death, Jesus used the blood that poured out of those wounds to take away the selfishness, the hatred, and the cruelty that had filled your heart and torn you apart. He used that blood to close the wounds that you had opened through your own self-righteousness. As that blood poured down from the wounds in his hands and his feet, the true temple of Jerusalem the God made flesh came down to you on the way to Jericho. There God walked towards the sinner who ran away from him. And in that moment, he gave you life. With the final breath from his lungs, he breathed the breath of life back into yours. Jesus Christ, the good Samaritan, was crucified for your sins. He was raised for your justification, and out of love for you, he placed the power of his cross and empty tomb into the sacraments and into his word of salvation. So when the good Samaritan binds up this man's wounds, that's, what's ha that's what happens when through the mouth of your pastor, Jesus binds up you with his word of absolution, when he wraps you in his healing and salvation. When the Good Samaritan pours oil and wine on this man's injuries, that's what happens when Jesus covers you in the waters of baptism that heal you of your sins and claim you as a child of God. And that's what happens when he feeds you with the bread and wine of Holy Communion, when he gives you the very body and blood that were broken and shed for you upon the cross and that close up all of your wounds of sin as you feast upon his righteousness. When the good Samaritan sets the man on his animal, takes him to the inn, this is what happens when Christ delivers you into the church, places you into the hands of those who will always call you their neighbor, their brother, and their friend. And when the good Samaritan pledges to pay all the expenses for the man's recovery, this is Jesus promising you that through the church, you will lack nothing. He will never stop giving you the forgiveness, the salvation, the love, and the mercy that you didn't deserve, but that he was always going to pour out upon you. Jesus Christ became the good Samaritan who walked down the wrong side of the road looking for the sinners who needed him to carry them back on the right side of that road into his kingdom. And that's what he did. And when Jesus did that, he found you. And even though you hated him and deserved every bit of condemnation and suffering that surrounded you, Jesus didn't look at you and say, that's not my neighbor. He looked at you and said, that is my neighbor, my brother and my friend. Jesus didn't curse you for being on the wrong side of the road. He walked over to the wrong side of the road picked you up, walked back to the right side of the road with your healed and restored body and soul, took you home and placed you within the walls of the church, the new Jerusalem where he will dwell with you and all the saints forever. That's what Jesus did for you when you were on the wrong side of the road. And so the next time that you come across some poor, pathetic sinner who's been torn to pieces pursuing his sin. Remember that. The next time you find your neighbor half dead on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, 
Remember what the good Samaritan did for you. Then go and do likewise. Amen.